So as much as we have this maybe a conception of the unconquered seminals, there were also conquered seminals. The majority of seminals were either killed or removed to Indian Territory, what is now Oklahoma. And we're talking about only two I claim Macaulay came to Florida in 18, what is it, 96, and he estimated, he tried making a census, he came up with 208. Now I think he undercounted, but he didn't undercount by thousands. He may have undercounted by a couple hundred. Um, it was hunting season and he didn't see that many men. Um, so maybe we double the number? Let's even pretend we triple the number in the 1890s there are 600. Now I don't believe that, that would be an outrageous miscounting. But even if there are only 600 people, or as many as 600 people, I hope we can imagine that in the 1850s and 1860s and 70s and 80s, whoever survived the three Seminole Wars had to rapidly and quickly start rebuilding a community on terms of their past, but on their present reality. In the 18-teens, Seminoles lived where we are today. Um, they lived in what was called Middle Florida. And they were removed during the first Seminole War down to, say, what is now close enough to Gainesville, Payne's Prairie, named for Chief Payne. And they lived there primarily until the second Seminole War pushed them farther south. And there were migrations south all the way along the way. But if one can imagine, now some of us in this room are from South Florida, have spent time there, or at least have been to, say, to Hollywood and the terrain of the interior of Florida, or have spent some time in the Everglades, or can imagine what that world was like before it was drained, one can see tremendous distinctions between what ecologically it meant to live in the panhandle versus what it meant to be in South Florida. One can imagine what it meant to be a member of roughly 8,000 Seminoles in middle Florida to what it means to be one of 200 Seminoles around Lake Okeechobee. The distinctions were tremendous. And out of these distinctions came a remarkable sense of innovation. Now, we normally don't use the word innovation to talk about Indians, um, but I want us to embrace that, because once upon a time, corn, bean, and squash, the three sisters that is kind of universal for native peoples, did not exist. And somewhere in Mesoamerica, there was this cultivation of corn that seemed to be quite a good idea, and it traveled its way up through Mesoamerica into basically what is now the United States, and it became tradition, and various traditions came born out of that. Uh, once upon a time, chickpeas were not traditional either. Once upon a time, patchwork was not as well. So if we can try to conceptualize this um, as innovation, we can start getting somewhere. And I think I'll give you a quotation by Clay Macaulay, this um, cultural missionary who came to Florida in the 1880s, to give us a sense for both the truth and the problem of dealing with innovation. He wrote, the seminal relationships are basically what we can call that of their mother tribe, the creek. The characteristics of other peoples have been practically obliterated. They were creeks, happening to live in South Florida. And Clay Macaulay established one of the first baseline ethnographies of the Seminoles. And the creeks are matrilineal. They trace their ancestry through their mother's line and not their father's line. So did the creeks. They have matrilineal clans, which are the equivalent of family, if you remember the same clan, even if you don't technically know how you're related, you know you are kin and you do not marry someone from that clan. So did the Creeks. They were matrilocal, which meant that when you got married, a husband moved into a wife's house, not the other way around. And the wife's house was often incredibly linked to her mother, and perhaps her mother's sister, and perhaps her mother's mother, but clusters of matrilineages, which meant clusters of clans. And Macaulay saw it. And he knew that's what Creeks did too. And the Seminoles were an offshoot of the Creek. And so for him, in 1880, it was all about continuity. Because his goal was to show how traditional those people are. And that's the language that he used. Those people are traditional. And so he started trying to measure other people on his expectation of what continuity meant. And when things looked traditional, they were. And traditional, of course, means what? Primordial, since dinosaur days. Now, I know that human beings and dinosaurs didn't coexist, and I say that sarcastically, but this idea that he came across a chiki, an open-walled, raised floor, thatched roof dwelling. Drew a picture of it. And that has become the quintessential traditional form of housing. Now, at that moment, he didn't look to see that the Creeks never lived in chiquis. The Calusa may have. 
long time before that. I don't think there were any clues around when the Seminoles came. And people around the globe have lived in it. And we can imagine living in the rising waters, humidity-ridden Everglades, where palm thatch roofs withstand wind remarkably well. And you don't particularly want to have, say, mud drab walls. You want the breeze to come in whenever you can get it. It's a nice adaptation, innovation to the environment. Um, but for Macaulay, this becomes the baseline for tradition. And he looked at the clans. He looked at their clans. There's the Wynn clan. And we can go back to the 16th, 17th, 18th century, especially the 17th and 18th centuries. And we can find Creek leaders who are remarkably powerful, who are members of the Wynn clan. And there's a Deer clan, too. But Macaulay didn't stop to see that there was an alligator clan. And in the alligator clan, there was no Creek alligator clan, especially when they lived in North Georgia. I hope you can understand why. There was also no big town clan. And had he stopped to ask the Seminoles themselves, they would have told them several stories of how the big clan was a modern creation to deal with either the presence, according to one story, of three white girls who were lost and had no place to live and got married into the community in some mass fashion or adopted in, depending on which story you hear. And they needed a place. And without a clan, you don't have a place. And that's how the story began. Or another version was there were lots of Creek clans with only a handful of survivors. When you go from 8,000 to 200, it doesn't split itself. If there are going to be 12 clans, it doesn't mean you have 17 members per clan. Some had one or two. And for a clan to survive and to have meanings, they regrouped imaginatively, innovatively, created something on the terms of the past. Clan itself was not new. Big town clan certainly was. So the Chiqui, which is on the seminal flag and the seminal um, emblem, as the almost the quintessential seminal symbol, was an innovative one. Um, and when Seminoles in the 1960s were given opportunities to live in cinder block constructed homes, some said absolutely not, some said absolutely yes. And when they were able to cluster their homes according to matrilocal lines, where they could have a nice cinder block constructed home with a granite kitchen in the 1990s and 2000s, and have a walkway to their mother, her mother, and they can cluster them in those fashions. All Seminoles today, at least amongst the Florida Seminoles, have abandoned the Chiqui other than for non-9 to 5 uses or 9 to 9 uses. The, another way to imagine the innovation, um, for 400 plus years, we don't have a means of getting at what was actually in some of the bowls in terms of recipes for what was in the bowls that were used for communal cooking. Um, prior to the arrival of Europeans. But we can see in the archaeological record, so much older than that, large bowls made out of clay, put over large fires. And at the very earliest images of Florida and Georgia, we see ears of corn in those things, and sometimes fish. Different images have different foods. But it's a corn base. We maybe even call it a gruel. But the Seminoles call Safki. Um, now, Safki is still drinking. But in the intermediary years, as they're moving farther into the interior of Florida, where corn did not grow nearly as well as, it, say, it did here in the agricultural heart of Florida, or in Georgia, where cornfields were plentiful, in the 1920s, Seminoles did something remarkable. They purchased grits.